Today I'll show you how to deploy SQL Server on Amazon Elastic Container Service for Kubernetes, or EKS. As you can see, I've logged into AWS console. This is Oregon region and this is my cloud formation console. There are no stacks created here yet. I go to Amazon EKS. Again, you can see there are no EKS clusters created yet in this account. You can create EKS clusters manually or you can use the CLI to do it. But deploy SQL Server on top of Kubernetes and particularly EKS, you have to go through several different steps. But to save some time, I have automated this uh, whole process using a script here. I have Windows PowerShell opened up. So if I type get help deploy MS SQL Server on EKS with Portworks, You can see some information about this script. For example, synopsis. This script deploys SQL Server on Amazon EKS. All the parameters. And here's a description of what this script will ultimately perform. As you can see, there are several different steps involved. Create networking infrastructure. Create IAM roles. Provision a managed cluster. Download install. And configure kubectl tool, etc., etc. So all of these activities will be performed on this script. And if any of these resources already exists, the script will reuse that so it will not try to overwrite it or anything like that. Again, you can see there's nothing else here. It's just a script. To see more details, I can add details to And that will give me a list of all of the parameters. And I can see each parameter and what it's used for. For example, PVC named in the persistent volume claim name, etc. You can see a description of all the parameters. Min CPU is the minimum amount of CPU resource assigned to SQL Server. This is used to assign the request parameter in Kubernetes. Default value is four. You can see all the details this way. Okay. Let's go ahead and start deploying. I have this script and I'll run it directly in PowerShell. It's asking for a key pair. I've already created a key pair name. Again, I'll show that key pair to you. If we go to EC2 console and navigate to key pairs, US West 2 is my key pair. If you've created one, you can create a key pair from console here. Anyway, I'm going to use this key pair. Now, checking if the IAM role that is required for running EKS already exists. EKS requires an IAM role, so it can access AWS resources on your behalf and I already had created that role. If it doesn't exist, the script would create a role for you. Then it checked whether the VPC stack already exists. This is the networking infrastructure, virtual private cloud, and all of the subnets inside the CIDR blocks and internet gateway, and all the other infrastructure networking resources. All of that is created through a cloud formation stack. It checked and it didn't exist. So now it's creating it. Now, if I go back to my cloud formation, if you remember, there were no stacks before, but now it has created this stack. EKS cluster VPC MS SQL PX and create is in progress. And the script, okay, it's created now. 
downloading the Cube CTL tool. That's the client tool that you would require to interact with it as a cluster. It checked and couldn't find the tool on this computer. So now it's downloading it. Once it's downloaded, then it will configure it. Then you'll be able to interact with the EKS cluster and query it and see what's going on inside it or deploy new applications on it, including SQL Server. And the script itself indeed requires kubectl to interact with EKS cluster and deploy MS SQL for us. All right, kubectl is downloaded. If I go back here, you can see kubectl is downloaded in this folder. Now, it's downloading AWS IAM Authenticator. This file is required to authenticate your user. The client that is connecting to EKS cluster. So whatever user I have configured in my CLI tool will be used by kubectl to connect to EKS cluster. Now it's creating the EKS cluster itself. EKS cluster is a managed service. Um, it will create three master nodes in three different availability zones, and all of that is managed with no additional cost. Creating that is performed through invocation of a single AWS API, and the rest of the work will be handled automatically in the background. But it'll take some time, and the script will wait until the status of the EKS cluster changes to active. Right now, the status is creating. Once it turns to active, it will resume the rest of the script. So I'll pause the video here because it may take a while. Once it's completed, I'll resume the video and we'll see how it goes. Okay, the cluster's created. Now it's configuring kubectl to enable it to connect to my EKS cluster the one that was created through the script. And it's telling us this is the identity that is used to connect the EKS cluster. That's the identity of my EC2 instance role. Next step, it's creating worker nodes. These are the nodes that will join the EKS cluster. And containers and pods will ultimately be scheduled on these nodes. It's using another cloud formation stack and checks whether it exists or not. EKS worker nodes, MS SQL, PX, status create in progress. If I run this same script the second time, it will quickly pass through these steps because these resources, the VPC, the worker nodes, and IAM roles, all of these already exist. So I can run the same script multiple times to deploy multiple instances of SQL Server on the same cluster. Worker nodes stack is also created. Now enabling worker nodes to join the EKS cluster. And now it's waiting for the nodes to join the cluster. It may take a while for the nodes to join a cluster and the script will keep watching for the status of nodes to see how many of them already uh, have already joined. As you can see, one node is available here and it's not ready yet. Now two nodes are available. Okay, now all three nodes are in ready state. Now the script is configuring Portworks. Portworks is used for storage. I could use a simple EBS backed storage class, but that wouldn't be highly available as I described in a previous video. That would be highly available in a single availability zone. And since I wanted to have a highly available multi-AZ deployment of SQL Server, I'm using Portworks, a partner solution that can cluster the storage across other availability zones. 
So if there's an AZ failure and my container cannot run in one AZ, it can transparently fail over to another AZ. Portworks is ready. Creating the storage class for Portworks volumes in Kubernetes. Setting it as default storage. Now it's prompting for SA password. Remember, you have to provide a strong password compliant with SQL Server password policy. Now it's telling me that this deployment is using four vCPUs and it has the capacity to burst to eight vCPUs as maximum resource. That's configurable through the parameters and you have to make sure you're compliant with your SQL Server licensing. So this is important information. All right, now SQL Server deployment has been created. We're waiting for the deployment to become available. Container created and it's running. Okay, SQL Server deployed on Kubernetes cluster using AWS EKS and Portworks, and this is a SQL Server endpoint. This is the endpoint of the network load balancer, which you can use to connect SQL Server from your applications or from Management Studio or any other client. Let's have a look at what's going on in our cluster. kubectl. Get deployments. As you can see, there's one deployment, MS SQL deployment. Now let's check services. There's also one service, MS SQL Deployment, Load Balancer, and it's the same deployment that you saw here. I'll show that Load Balancer to you in a moment. But before that, let's have a look at storage. Get Persistent Volume Claim. You have eight gigabytes, that's the persistent volume claim. MS SQL data, it's bound. That's the default capacity. You can of course change it through the parameters. And what about persistent volumes? Persistent volume, again, eight gigabytes and it's bound. So that's what you have. And what about the SA password? Secrets. There it is, MS SQL. The actual password is stored inside that. Now, if I go to my EC2 instances, There are four instances running. Three nodes and three different availability zones and one ETCD instance that is required for Portworks. If I go to volumes, there are some volumes over there that are used by Portworks. So the volume that is used for SQL Server is an abstraction layer on top of these volumes. All of these are attached to our EC2 instances. And the actual storage is an abstraction volume used by SQL Server. And if I go to load balancers,
there it is. There's one load balancer, and that's the same name, A2BC0. Remember, that's the output of the script. It's listening to port 1433. That's the default SQL Server port. Now, let's see if we can connect to it from Management Studio. I'll paste the endpoint here. Username SA, password. Same password as I have provided during setup. And as you can see, it's connecting to my SQL Server instance. It takes a while to connect because I'm based in Sydney and created this cluster in US West 2, the Oregon region. So because of the latency, it takes a while. It's not because the performance of SQL Server is low, it's because of the network latency. And this is also a highly available instance of SQL Server, similar to what you get with failover cluster instances. Difference is that you didn't have to go through all of the steps to set up a failover cluster instead. Since it's deployed on top of Kubernetes, it's inherently highly available, and because I'm using Portworx, I can also fail over to other availability zones. Well, that's it. Thanks for watching, and goodbye.